Well, good morning. Welcome to Jacksonville Presbyterian. While you're still standing, if you would, grab your Bibles, turn to John chapter 7. If you don't have a print Bible in front of you, there are blue hardback Bibles all throughout the room. You can turn to page 1061, but I'd love for everybody to have a copy of God's printed word out in front of them as we read from John chapter 7, verses 1 through 24 this morning. Uh, If you're just joining us, if this is your first Sunday, welcome to Jacksonville Presbyterian. I'm Dustin. I get to be the pastor here. And uh, we had a great kids program, as Joy just talked about. Uh, You'll be able to find it later this afternoon on our YouTube page. So just go on YouTube and search Jacksonville Presbyterian, and you can see what the kids did earlier this morning. It was truly, truly beautiful. Uh, So with that in mind, let's read from God's Word in John chapter 7 to us this morning. Christian, hear the word of the Lord. John chapter 7, starting in verse 1. After this, Jesus went about in in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. So his brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea that your disciples also may see the works that you're doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, But in private, the Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people. While some said, he's a good man. Others said, no, he's leading the people astray. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled saying, how is it that this man has learning when he's never studied? So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he'll know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. Has not Moses given you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, you have a demon. Who's seeking to kill you? Jesus answered them, I did one work and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it's from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me? Because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Friends, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will endure forever. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Would you be seated and keep that Bible open in front of you as we pray? Now, Father, as we open up your word, we pray by your Holy Spirit that we would have eyes to see Jesus. Lord, that we would seek him and seek him only. In his name we pray, amen. Well, if you know anything about me, you'll know that I am greatly influenced by a bunch of old dead guys. Uh, Not that I believe that they're still dead, I think they're living with Jesus, but I love old dead guys. A few weeks ago, I talked about one old dead guy from the 1700s named Jonathan Edwards, whom I adore, Uh, but probably the greatest influence on my life, apart from Jesus, the oldest, deadest, yet alivest guy that I listen to, is a guy uh, who actually is from Africa, and his name was St. Augustine. Uh, Before moving to Oregon, I lived in Florida, and one of our oldest cities in America is named after him, St. Augustine, Florida. Anyone ever been to St. Augustine? It's uh, very, very, very old and beautiful. Well, it's named after St. Augustine. So who is St. Augustine? Well, the first thing you need to know about St. Augustine is he was a man who was seeking something his entire life. In fact, he wrote 
the world's first autobiography. Anyone here ever read an autobiography or just love reading autobiographies of someone's life? Augustine came up with that genre. He invented it. Think about that. In the known world in the 300s, no one was writing blogs or autobiographies. No one had that much gumption. And yet Augustine, in his famous work, The Confessions of St. Augustine, anyone ever read The Confessions in college? That was the world's first autobiography. And what's so great about Augustine is even though he was African, and even though he lived 1,700 years ago, if you read the confessions and you know his life story, he reads like somebody alive today. In fact, most of the way that you and I think in terms of Western thinking comes directly from Augustinian thought. So what makes Augustine so relatable? Well, uh, Augustine was born in a poor community in Africa, And his whole life, all he ever wanted to do was get away from his religious mother, Monica. He thought she was nuts. She drove him crazy. And so all Augustine ever wanted to do was leave home, leave the shores of Africa, and get into Italy and to make it in the big city. And so at an early age, Augustine goes to Carthage, learns Greek philosophy in Carthage of all places. Then he gets an appointment, a job in Milan. Anyone ever go shopping in Milan? No, you haven't. It's too expensive. It's incredibly cosmopolitan today. And it was cosmopolitan in Augustine's day. And anyone ever been a young person, or maybe you are, and you want to move away to the big city and make it in Portland or Seattle or New York? Well, Augustine was a young man who loved women, who had deep friendships, had many girlfriends, and wanted to make it in the big city. And he was incredibly ambitious. He was a man who was seeking something. In fact, that's very much what the confessions are about. Of course, as Augustine is seeking something that he can't quite put his finger on, his mother was also seeking something as well, which was for her son to finally know Jesus. In fact, uh, it, the whole story of St. Augustine is always told with St. Augustine and St. Monica, his mother. And in fact, just like Florida has St. Augustine, Florida, California has Santa Monica, Florida. Anyone ever been to Santa Monica? It was named after Augustine's mother because she is the patron saint of godly women praying for their sons to come to faith and not be such knuckleheads. It's not even, that's not even a joke. I think the first service thought I was telling a joke. That's just true. That's who Santa Monica is. So she was seeking for her son to know Jesus, whereas Augustine spends most of his life seeking something that he can't quite put his finger on. You know, maybe it was his career. Maybe it was his romantic relationships, of which there were numerous. Maybe it was his longing that he was just from Podunk, Africa. Who was he? Maybe it was ambition to be significant, to prove everybody around him that they were wrong about exactly what he could accomplish. You see, the reason I bring up Augustine is because seeking, that kind of seeking, is all woven throughout the Gospel of John. In fact, the word seek or seeking occurs 40 times in the Gospel of John, and it works almost like a key where you can unlock the whole Gospel of John just by noticing the times that someone says the word seeking. In fact, the first words out of Jesus' mouth in the Gospel of John are these, what are you seeking? And some of the last words that Jesus says when he meets Mary at the resurrection is he says, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And if you look at John chapter 7, you'll notice that the word seek occurs all throughout this passage. Look with me in your lap. Look at verse 7 1. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were what? Seeking to kill him. Verse 4 For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. Verse 11 The Jews were, right there in Greek, it's actually seeking. The Jews were seeking for him at the feast. And then Jesus starts to shed light on what he himself is seeking. The one who speaks on his own authority, who makes this stuff up, he seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of the Father is true. Verse 19, why do you seek to kill me? And then the crowd, like most people, 
they respond with, who is seeking anything? No one's seeking to kill you. In fact, if you read 7 through 8, you'll just underline or you could highlight all the times seeking appears. Verse 25, verse 30, verse 34. I think you're getting the idea. So to understand John 7, friends, what I want to encourage you to consider is that we have to figure out what people are seeking if we're going to find out what John 7 has for us to know. All right, so let's dive right in. What are these Jews seeking. Look at verse 7-1. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea. That is near Jerusalem, the city, the capital, because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now, of course, full disclaimer, you and I uh, were reading this as English speakers, and so the word Jews there may strike you as a bit funny. Just for reference, remember, Jesus is Jewish. The author of this book is Jewish. The 12 apostles were Jewish, and the crowds in this story are all Jewish, as are Jesus' brothers who appear in this story. They're all Jewish. So when John writes Judean, literally in Greek, the Judeans, what he's referring to is not the Jewish people of which Jesus and his family and his disciples are a part of. He's talking about the Jewish religious leaders, those in authority. Right, So you can see how it's a reference to those in authority. Right there, look at verse 12 and 13. There was much muttering about Jesus among the people. Right, But then that's put opposed to verse 13, yet for fear of the Jews, that is the religious leaders at the time, no one spoke openly of him. So what is it that these religious leaders are seeking? What are they hoping to get? Well, verse 7-1 tells us that they are seeking to kill Jesus. Now, why in the world are they seeking to kill Jesus? Well, part of it is because Jesus, uh, Jesus doesn't really mess around with people. And uh, I know we like to think of Jesus as nice, uh, but Jesus is very much a truth teller. And he can be very challenging, even for those of us who follow him. He can say some pretty challenging things. If you need an idea of some of those challenging things, you can read John 6. Uh, those are a lot of challenging things that we have just been studying about. But the Jews here, the religious leaders, are seeking to kill Jesus for a very specific reason. In fact, there's sort of two reasons that he gets to. Look at verse 21 through 24. At the very end, we start to see why these guys are seeking to put Jesus to death. In verse 22, Jesus is talking to these people, and he mentions how Moses gave circumcision, and yet... On the Sabbath day, you know, if a little Jewish boy needs to be circumcised on the eighth day, Jesus says, well, you circumcise him, even though that's considered work, right? So you uphold God's law, you know, and you're judging me because I did one thing. Look at verse 20. He says, I did one work and you want to kill me. And what does it have to do with Sabbath? What is he talking? Why is he talking about Moses? And, and he says, well, if you can circumcise a kid on a Sabbath, well, certainly I can make a whole person well on Sabbath, What's your big deal? You need to judge with right judgment. What's this one work? Well, to understand what's going on, uh, you need to understand a little bit about the Jewish calendar. You see, in the Jewish calendar, there were three great festivals. In the springtime, there was Passover. And then 50 days later, there was something called the Feast of Weeks, or we could call it Pentecost. But then six months later, there was another festival that span for a whole week, and really it was everybody's favorite holiday because they all got to live in tents. We call them booths, but it would be like the great Jerusalem RV conference. That's what one guy called it, right? Everyone got to live in Jerusalem in tents for a week, and it was during September and October, and that's when this story is taking place. And as John 7, 1 already talked about, Jesus hasn't gone back to Jerusalem since the last time he was in Jerusalem, And the last time Jesus was in Jerusalem at a big feast, he took a man who was paralyzed and he made him whole. And how do the religious leaders respond? Well, if you just flip one page, you can find out in John 5, 18. In John 5, 18, Jesus heals the man and it says in 5, 18, this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because not only was he breaking the Sabbath in their perception, But he was even calling God his own father, making himself, what? Equal with God. You see, they primarily want to kill Jesus, not because he's a miracle worker, not because Jesus says, love your neighbor and love your enemies while you're at it. They want to kill Jesus. 
because he makes himself equal to God. (laughs) You see, Jesus' argument in John 5, if you remember, is he says, I can heal, I can do a good work on Sabbath, just like God can do whatever he wants on Sabbath. See, Jesus is saying, just like God can do whatever he wants on Sabbath, so can I. And it's not lost on these religious leaders that Jesus is making himself out to be God's equal, which for them was blasphemy. And also, Jesus is talking to religious people who should have known who he is. And the whole time, Jesus is telling these religious leaders, you are all a bunch of hypocrites. You don't know who I am. You claim to know God. But if you really knew God, you would know who I am because I am God in the flesh. And yet you are trying to kill me. In the other Gospels, we find out that these religious leaders are greedy. And I know this is going to be like so hard for you. But I want you to try as hard as you can. Oh, that sounded good. Uh, That wasn't intentional. But in your mind's eye, imagine religious leaders. This is going to be really hard. Imagine religious leaders who are motivated more by money than the truth. I can't even say that with a straight face. Um, it's, I know it's going to be hard to believe, but there could be religious people who are out for their own financial gain. Also, he says to these religious leaders in Matthew 23, he says, oh, you like going around town and you like everybody greeting you. You love to be called rabbi in the marketplace and at the coffee shops. You love all the seats of honor. He says, you guys, woe to you, oh, hypocrites. And I know it's really hard to imagine a religious leader who is a hypocrite. But if you can just try, (laughs) that's what Jesus is calling these people out to. Do you see why Jesus says in our passage, why the world hates him? (laughs) Look at John 7, 7. He says, the world hates me because I testify it that all these religious leaders, pomp and circumstance and self-importance, It's just pride. It's ugly pride, and it's sinful. And they claim to know God, but they don't even know him when they see him in the flesh. So what are they seeking? Well, they're seeking to put Jesus to death. And and don't forget, they don't stop until they succeed. All right, so who else is in this story? Well, the, that's what the, uh, the, the religious leaders are seeking. But there's, another, there's all kind of groups of people that are interesting in this story. Um, so now we need to turn our attention to Jesus' brothers. Look at verse 2 through 5. Now, the Jews' feast of booze was at hand, right? It's fall. It's fall, right? September, October. So his brothers said to Jesus, hey, leave here and go down to Jerusalem and to Judea. Judea is the state. Jerusalem's the capital. And you'd need to do this so that your disciples also may see the works that you're doing. And hey, buddy, no one does something in secret if you want to be known publicly, am I right? So if you're going to do these miracles, Jesus, if you're going to say you're the king, why don't you just show yourself to the world? Now, that's a very hard statement to interpret. Are they saying this sarcastically? Are they saying this lovingly? And this is why it's so helpful for us that John writes verse 5. For not even his brothers believed in him. So it may not be, I don't think this is them trying to get their brother killed, like the the 12 tribes of Israel. Remember those, they try to get their youngest brother killed. I don't think they're trying to get Jesus to reveal himself so that he'll die. I think instead what these brothers are doing is they don't really believe in Jesus. They don't really see what he's come to do. And if you remember from last week, a lot of Jesus' disciples have abandoned him. Six months have passed since John chapter 6 at the Passover when Jesus fed all of those people and they ate the bread. And then Jesus says, well, I'm really the bread. I'm the bread of life. You've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And everyone said, oh, that's too weird. We're out of here. Look at John 6, 66. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. You see, I think what the brothers are, are doing here is they're saying, Jesus, you're about to lose the movement, buddy. I don't, I don't know if you've been paying attention to numbers at all, but, buddy, the numbers are way down. Look, if you're who you say, you might as well just go into Jerusalem and march right in and just show everybody what you can do. And notice how Jesus responds to this. Jesus says in verse 6, he said to them, my time has not yet come. Your time's always here. And Jesus, well, all Jesus means by that is he's saying, any time works for you to go to Jerusalem 
but the timeline that I'm on is not your timeline. I'm on my father's timeline. And I'm going to go when he tells me to. Because my time has not yet come. And if you remember, any time in the Gospel of John, Jesus starts to talk about his time or his hour. He's always referring to the time that he's going to lay down his life for the sheep. When he's going to be killed on a cross for the sins of all of his people to offer them salvation. And so this story starts to sound eerily similar to an earlier story in John 2 when Jesus and his family are at a wedding in Cana and his mother comes to him and she says, Jesus, all the wine's gone. Do something about it. And you remember what Jesus says? He says, woman, my time hasn't come. It's not time for me to reveal myself because when I reveal who I truly am, I'm going to die on a cross. You see here, Jesus' family come to him again, and they say, reveal yourself. Show the world who you are. Do a miracle. And Jesus says, my time hasn't come. Because the next time I march into Jerusalem, I'm not just going to turn over the tables. I'm going to march into Jerusalem as the promised Messiah King on a donkey. And that's going to lead me to a cross. And when I come in Jerusalem, there'll be no mistaking who I am. But all of that, guys, that happens at Passover, not at the Feast of Booths. It's not the right festival, guys. I am here to be the Passover lamb who dies for us. So what are the brothers seeking? I don't really, I don't, I don't know that I, we can say for sure. But we do know that they want Jesus to take their advice. And what I want to suggest to you, friends, is it's not always a good idea to try to give God our advice. Anyone ever feel like when you're praying, you're just trying to give God advice on what to do? You know, I feel like sometimes when I think about my prayer life, I'm like, I feel like I have a wonderful plan for God's life that I can't wait to tell him about. You know? God, I love you, and I have a wonderful plan for your life, also my life, but primarily you. So here's what I want you to do for me. But notice that when the disciples try to tell Jesus, hey, buddy, you need to get on our plan. Hey, now's the time. Jesus doesn't take their advice. So what is it that Jesus is seeking? What does Jesus seek in this story? You know, the crowd, they're just trying to figure out, they're just trying to figure out who Jesus is, right? What does Jesus seek? Well, he tells us exactly what he's seeking, right? Look at verse uh, 14 through the following. You know, so about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple. You know, it means he, about halfway through the festival, he came, and he is going to reveal himself, but not on anybody else's timeline. And he begins teaching. And these Jewish leaders, they're all marveled because they say, how is this guy speaking and teaching like this when he's never, ever studied under any rabbi that we know about? Where does he get this incredible Bible knowledge and teaching? Is he just making it up? In verse 16, Jesus answered them. He says, look, I'm not making it up. My teaching is not my own. It doesn't come from a man. It's not coming from me. It is him who sent me. It's the Father's. And then he goes on and he says, the one who speaks on his own authority, religious nuts who think they can make this stuff up on their own, they're seeking their own glory. Look, I'm not making this stuff up. Those who want their own glory, yeah, they'll be prideful and make it up. But I'm not trying to make much of myself. Jesus says, I'm trying to make much of the Father who sent me. And I speak the truth, and there's no falsehood in me. That's what he says in verse 18. You see, Jesus is seeking to do the Father's will. And of course, that word seeking, right, it just, it just echoes through the corridors of the Gospel of John. Because later on in John 18, Jesus will ask that same question, what are you seeking? Except this time it'll be, Roman guards come to arrest him so that he can be crucified. And if you remember in John 18, the guards come with Judas, you know, the story when he's betrayed. And Jesus looks at the guards and he says, whom are you seeking? 
and they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And then he says these simple words, I am. Whom are you seeking? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am he. And of course, at the resurrection, when Mary's at the empty tomb and she finally sees that Jesus was telling the truth all along, that he died for our sins and was raised to make all things new, starting with himself. When she sees Jesus alive, remember what Jesus asked her? He says, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? See, this is what Jesus was seeking to do all along. And notice for Jesus, that means trusting God's timing. It means following his father's timeline, not his brother's, not anybody else's. He is going to die, but it will be at the foreknowledge and definite plan of God. As Peter will one day preach in Acts chapter 2. You see, we read this a bit earlier, but in Galatians, notice the emphasis on the definite plan for Jesus to lay down his life. Notice the emphasis on time. This is Galatians 4, 4, which you heard already. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the curse of the law, that we might receive adoption as the children of God. You see, Jesus is following God's timing for his life. Paul, writing decades later, put it this way, for at the right time, why will we were still ungodly, Christ died for us at the right time. See, that's what Jesus is seeking. The crowd, they can't even admit they're seeking anything. <laughs> These people, they're just trying to make up in their minds who in the world is Jesus. Look at verse 20. Who's seeking anything? Who's seeking to kill you? You see, the big question that everybody has to answer at some point in their life is who in the world is Jesus? You know, I don't, you know if you say, I don't trust religious people. They're all hypocrites and greedy and out for gain. I'm like, yep, that's why I'm a Calvinist. I don't trust people, right? Not even an amen on that one? <laughs> Not even. I'm working on y'all. I don't trust people. Amen. There we go. But friends, if that's how you feel about religious, if you're skeptical of them, friends, you know who you sound oddly similar to? Jesus. But Jesus says, look, I'm not lying to you. I'm not lying to you. I'm true, and there's no falsehood in me. You know, how do you respond to that kind of statement? I mean, that's what Jesus has come to do, reveal who he is, which is God the Son, come to bring us to God the Father by the power of God the Holy Spirit that we might live with him forever. You know, the crowd responds in all kind of ways, right? I mean, like some people say he has a demon, that he's crazy, that he's possessed. Some people are like, well, he's just a good guy. You know, did you catch that? The crowd says, well, he's a good man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what a, what's a, what a patronizing thing to say. I mean, imagine dying and meeting Jesus. and be like, well, you were a good guy. You were okay. You done good. That's so patronizing. That's not who Jesus is. So who in the world, is he just a good moral teacher? Is he just a good guy? Is he a liar? Well, C.S. Lewis famously you know, said this better than anybody in the 1950s in Mere Christianity. Um, he says these famous words about how Jesus is either a liar, either he's a lunatic, <laughs> or he actually is Lord. Uh, C.S. Lewis wrote these words. A guy who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he's also a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up and call him a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as if he were a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. You see, what Lewis is getting at is to follow Jesus. You've got to accept him for who he is. Um, he's not lying. 
and he's not crazy. Uh, but if, if, that, you know, if you're struggling with that question, you may be thinking, like, well, how in the world am I supposed to know that? You can talk to me all day, but you know, how am I supposed to actually believe that and uh, you know, actually start obeying him? You know, it just seems so far. Um, but I want to suggest something to your thinking that, that it may be a paradox. You know, it may be kind of hard to understand, but I think it'll make sense if you think about it. And uh, I think it's, it's too often we think of sort of like following and obeying Jesus, doing what we're supposed to do, you know, and, and belief. It's like, well, I've got to believe first. I've got to like believe totally in Jesus. I've got to understand all these points of theology. And then I can talk to you about maybe obeying him with my lifestyle. But primarily, I will believe first, and then, only then will I obey. But of course, the problem is that only those who obey actually believe. Yes, those who believe will obey Jesus, but it is also profoundly true, friend, that obedience, following Jesus, leads to belief in him. Think about it this way. When Jesus looks at the disciples and he says, follow me, it is a call to obey the command of a king. They don't know everything about Jesus yet. They don't believe everything there is. But their obedience to the call of Jesus is what allows them one day to finally fully believe. You see, when people struggle to believe, I think what, they, what they're really missing is that your disobedience and my disobedience kills belief. It kills belief. I, I don't know if this will make sense, but the best example I can make of this, belief leads to obedience, but also obedience helps you believe. It's not either or, it's both and. Uh, the only way that I can really even like explain to you how this works um, is to, I, I remember a, a movie I watched years ago in college. It was, it was it's called Paris, Je Tem. Paris, I Love You. Anybody seen it? Uh, it has 18 different short films. So it's not one movie, it's 18 short films. And it's 18 different directors trying to embody Paris in about five or six minutes. Um, I'm not endorsing all of the movies, you know, it's been a long time, but there's one visceral story that has always stuck with me. And it's about a man who meets his wife in a beautiful Parisian cafe. And as they're eating this beautiful Parisian breakfast, the man in his mind is about to tell his wife that he's leaving her for another woman. And right before he tells her, I'm leaving you, she looks at her husband and says, honey, I have terminal cancer and I'm going to die. And immediately the husband calls off the affair, leaves his lover, and devotes the rest of his three months of living to his dying wife. And it becomes a montage of them living in Paris and him caring for her as she slowly ends up more and more in her bed. And at the end of the story, she dies. But the story explains that it was in his serving his wife, in his obeying the call of what it means to be a man to his wife, that love sprung anew. You see, he was thinking, well, I'm not really feeling the love right now, so I don't have to obey what God's calling me to do. And yet in the story, it was obedience to the call that created the love again. So what is Jesus' call to obey? How do you seek the right thing? I think it's right there in verse 17. If anyone's will, if anyone seeks to do God's will, I will reveal myself to him. You see, to know who Jesus is, you just got to want to do God's will. You just got to want it. You just got to want it. <laughs> I mean, what's the best ingredient to any Christmas meal? Anybody, what's the best ingredient you could ever put into a meal? It ain't water and it's not salt. What's the best ingredient? Make you slap your mom, it's so good. Anybody know? Hunger. Hunger will make a bowl of Cheez-Its feel like you're eating a Parisian cafe with brie cheese and wine. 
Buddy, I tell you, if you are hungry, anything tastes good. All you've got to want is to be hungry. Hunger. Hunger to want to know God, to do his will. I mean, that's what you've got to seek, right? I mean, you can seek the career. You can seek to get away from mom. I mean, Monica. You can seek to make it in the big city. I mean, some of you probably used to live in Santa Monica and are actively seeking to get away from people, right? And that's why you're here. But friends, what if all of your seeking was really only ever satisfied in seeking God's will, seeking to know Jesus? And what if obeying that call was actually what sparks belief? And what if belief sparks the desire to obey? You know, in his book on confessions, St. Augustine says probably one of the most famous lines in all of human history Um, It's been repeated countless times. It's shaped the course of the world in a lot of ways. And Augustine says says this about seeking. You see, all of his women and all of his girlfriends and all of his buddies and all of his career stuff, he realized it was all for nothing when he he met Jesus. And yeah, he, he kept having friends. And yes, he got life and he got to speak in front of people. But it was all new because Jesus was at the focus of it. His mom was right all along, as it turns out. (laughs) And Augustine says this, You stir us so that praising you will bring us joy, because you have made us and will draw us to yourself. And our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Friends, that's an invitation to change what you're seeking. Let's pray. Father, it's so easy to seek after careers and ambitions, uh, to get away from family, uh, to get back to family, uh, to go to the big city or leave the big city. Uh, But Father, all of our strivings are only ever satisfied in you. And so, Jesus, we pray that we would seek your will and none other. Amen.